the quote is by Roland d'Orgelès, who um, was visiting a colony and who wit was a witness to extractivism. And so he, he reported um, seeing in, I think it was 1924, he was visiting Indochina and he looked around very carefully and he said he saw in the eyes of the miners who were being exploited that uh, French Indochina would not last more than 30 years. So if you make the maths, which is about my level in maths, it reaches 1954, which is the um, defeat <clears throat> where the, the people there earn sovereignty because sovereignty is never granted. It's always conquered. So this is maybe a connection also to Stephen Bird's um, talk about, um, you know, anti-colonial, decolonial uh, practices. So thank you for this apt introduction. And um, today's paper, for those who uh, are interested to take a look at a long version, there's a French a long version that went live on the AL preprint archive. So it's under the, the French title announced on the program. Um, and the idea is to look back, uh, see where I'm talking from. So basically I'm a field linguist, that's how I would identify, trained as a phonetician as well and committed to language documentation, you know, using um, the digital tools to um, salvage what can be rescued of languages that are um, on the verge of disappearing. And so the idea here is to see, look back on what I did, how it was grounded in the here and now of when I um, did the work, and also, um, acknowledge the people with whom the, the trip is happening, uh, which is the meaning of having a first author, Camille Nuss, who is a virtual uh, author. I hope not simply as a serving prop to say that, you know, I stand back, even though I'm a keynote speaker, I'm also uh, an extremely humble and nice white knight, but really to acknowledge that um, the work is being done, that we are catalysts to things happening inside teams around us. And so there's a collective effort to add authorship by Camille Nuss to say that it can be colleagues of us of ours who should be here but can't because they have been sort of centrifugated out because of too few job opportunities or simply because if one named all the names in the acknowledgements, which are in the online version, that would be too much for a list of authors. But um, certainly, um, I'm very grateful to the, for the invitation to give this talk about my practices and its relationship to ethics as a field worker, um, because thanks to Catherine's invitation, this was a way to connect to other colleagues who read the paper and said, let's continue this conversation. We've been thinking along parallel lines. So this is a very meaningful episode for me. And the idea um, to look at ethical considerations in field linguistics in the era of natural language processing. So uh, to put it in a, a fun way, because NLP is, um, a lot of it is done by people who um, would confess to using video games and enjoying video games. So what's the game and who's your fighter? Um, there's, uh, if we look at the uh, tools side of open science, then the idea is that some people would find strong motivation in uh, saying, okay, we are small companies or we are working for free software foundations. So the opponent for us is the big data greedy companies. Um, and so here's uh, uh, Karatika Duck device, a monster wearing GAFAM logos. And that's um, a recent illustration by the people at Pharmasoft which is sort of their motivation that say, we want to, uh, we're small, but we know what we're about and we want to de googleize internet and do things like that. So that's um, interesting things I'm learning about the uh, software world. Level two would be, okay, we want free software and we want free hardware. And this is a very delightful um, book, which is exactly uh, right for my daughter's age. Ada uh, und Zangeman to explain how you should 
know about you know these extractivist practices or you know dominating practices from big companies and think of ways that one could um you know do do better so the uh, young girl is the person who wants to re uh, gain power over the tools and the games and um the raspberry ice cream machine and not just uh, live the life that the big companies are dictating. And now level three, it's uh, what I would like to talk about today and where I started in the late 1990s, which is, uh, you know, we want fighters to address the big problem of decent data management. Uh, so here are three uh, heroes. Uh, Big fighters. One is uh, senior data protection officer Gaël Buchan. One is, um, and the other two are from other uh, host institutions or parent institutions for my research unit. Uh, Céline Eres works at Université Sorbonne Nouvelle. She's the DPO. And at bottom, Sarah Cadorel is an archivist working at Inalco Longzo. Uh, so working on um, mostly foreign languages from the Far East, sort of. French style SOAS. And what do they fight against? Well, it's the RDM, the research data mess, because this is at the time when um, I uh, sort of began my work. Uh, I came from uh, sort of literary studies, humanities, where the job is to look at a poem and you do, you know, you hide a small element like you do for an LLM, you hide a word and try to have the LLM guess it. Well, here you ask the students, what difference does it make if you replace the comma by colon here? And okay, sometimes the difference is a bit tenuous, but there's always a difference, you know, any detail matters. And now I was coming into a field of linguistics where people were very casual about the way data uh, were handled that they would say, okay, are you a native speaker? Well, then go ahead. Is this sentence grammatical or not? And I found that data management was not um, the same as in the humanities. We have, you know, the canon of great texts and which is supposed to be perfect in every respect. And you're supposed to study how and why. And in linguistics and phonetics, the databases were not in a, a good shape. So basically, uh, the priority to me was to limit the loss of data. There's a um, big stat by the Research Data Alliance that says that the loss is on the order of 5% a year. That's across all fields of study, and it's pretty constant. So, of course, um, um, that covers very different realities from one field to the other, because, you know, um, language data, when the language is uh, not being transmitted anymore at all. Um, well, loss, data loss doesn't mean quite the same as if you're just, you know, counting cars on motorways and you could theoretically carry the study anew or want to get rid of the data and get fresh data acquisition later. But the stat is there. So that's a lot because that means after 20 years, 30 years, the chances of getting data are small and the chances of getting intact uh, good data are really very small. So it affects audio and video recordings, transcriptions and dictionaries for the, you know, language part, and it affects digital storage as well as analog storage and paper. So we all have um, horror stories that we could share that people who left the field because a uh, hard drive crashed and they had a dictionary on it, which was the work of two years or three years, but when you're 20, you know, three years is a lot of time. Um, seen at from 50, it doesn't sound that bad, but that's a different perspective. And importantly, uh, data loss is linear, but it's not perfectly linear. And there can be events such as the um, burning of the um, National Museum of Brazil, which uh, was recent. And here's a, a human-made summary that says 200 years of history and 20 millions of artifacts have um, come to ashes. So of course, we don't need to worry because tech will solve it. You just need to take shovels of ashes. You put it into an uh, artificial intelligence and 
boom, out comes the data, including, of course, the digital part and a reconstitution of the hard artifacts, such as the first human bones of the Americas, and it'll all come out all right, won't it? And the problem is that um, inside there were lots of records, especially of um, minority languages of the Americas. So when I went to do field work in the 1990s, uh, the best description was still 18th century, 17th century and 18th century descriptions by uh, missionaries who were really at a colonial period and they recorded what they recorded histories uh, like chronicles. They um, recorded theater plays and uh, law, which is orally transmitted corpora of law. And those were tremendous works. And nobody had ever done better since. Then in the 21st century, there was a great effort that from the year 2000 to 2020, there has been a tremendous improvement in our knowledge of languages of the Amazon, for instance, and you know the Latin America and everything. I wasn't part of it, but it happened. And then uh, this event happened and lots of uh, things simply cannot be retrieved. So that was, um, uh, let's try to make it cool and fun and smile, but it's not. Um, okay, so at the time, most researchers did not consider that they had a public service duty to disseminate or preserve the data they collected. This is um, a statement from Josephine Simono, who is one of my heroes and fighters, and who single-handedly basically took the archives of the Musée de l'Homme in the masculine, and made it into a state-of-the-art digital archive against the pressure of all the researchers who basically sort of frowned upon the idea that she could take recordings back from her their desk, which was ideally the best place to be, you know, learned about and studied, back to the library for digitization and diffusion to other people who would, of course, not uh, use the data as well as they would personally. Anyway. A, a tremendous work. And so the data excuse bingo, which um, uh, was done by Jenny Molloy and inspired Emily and Karen doing a NLP ethics excuse bingo, uh, has it all. And at the time, that is what we heard, really. So saying, okay, my data contains personal uh, sensitive information, so uh, I have a legal obligation to dump it. Uh, which is um, a terrible confusion between two um, kinds of laws. One is about privacy protection, so that's GDPR style uh, regulation, and the other one is data preservation laws. So heritage code for NLP people means just old code from the 1990s. Uh, so let's not translate Code uh, du one as heritage code, but patrimony code, and that says that Research data should not be dumped, uh, depending on the typology they get into. If it's endangered language data and the language um, data were collected as part of um, you know, public action, um, um, public service, then they should be preserved. But people say, no, no, there's people's names in it, and so I can't keep it. And that is technically correct. We're not supposed to keep on our laptops and mobile phones and or papers in our offices, the names and personal information of people beyond the time when we're still using it for research. But those should be really kept distinct. And in people's heads, including mine, those were pretty much confused. Um, and then people would say, you know, my funder doesn't require it, I think is the last and most important of that, until those become a regulation that no, you can't get funded to uh, do um, missions in faraway places that are expensive and complicated unless you make provisions for preserving data. But those things were not in place in the 1990s, um, not really until now, basically, like 2022, 2023. So that was uh, the state of the art at the time. And so um, the idea was to say, let's salvage the data. Here's a, another wink at uh, Stephen, uh, that 
Legal and ethical topics were not among the seven pillars of open language archiving that were identified by Simons and Bird, because obviously there was more um, urgent things to do. First, let's get organized. And because basically when OLAP was built, it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it came as the foundational movement for the open archive saying, look, we walk into a digital world where not only could one uh, make copies and preserve the data, but one could give them away. And the, the more copies people got, the better. So that's a very different approach. It's a revolution really from the library time when librarians who have made a beautiful collection are very careful how they lend it out and how they, even they let people get it. That you're not supposed to fold the books in this way or that, and they want to close at you know 10 p.m. Okay, that's very unFrench, but that would be the very last deadline. And no, 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 you can't, you know, photocopy complete volumes. And and now, you know, here it was. You could just by having turning your computer into a server and um, having proper metadata, the whole world would be able to locate the data, and we would build huge libraries. So you remember the spirit of the times, this uh, very eloquent papers on XML and why that was the way forward for the web. And at the time saying, you know, let's um, think about, you know, how we can make the legal frameworks in all the countries, um, you know, in line with one another, knowing that, you know, American style um, law and French style law remain very different kettle of fish. And so I think it was a very wise choice not to try to have everything completely clear from a legal point of view before OLAC moved forward. And so that's what we did. At LACITO, we have now um, what is called the Pangloss Collection. It was called LACITO Archive Program, but it was not a very brilliant term. So Pangloss is uh, better fun, especially for those who have had to go through high school French um, classes and they know about Voltaire and um, so put the things out and add the dots on the map because uh, I'm not showing you the map where it's all the places that people from our research centers have been to but it's about double the amount and it means half the data sets have not yet been archived um, it's a, really a rule of thumb but I think um, the um, overall uh, yield of the process of collecting data on languages that people knew from 1976 when the lab was officially founded were on the way out because they had ceased to be transmitted already for some time is about four percent which is like a steam machine uh, locomotive they look good and the ratio between the um, you know thermal power you get from burning wood or coal and the actually kinetic energy is four percent which uh, kept the locomotives running but wasn't that great um i think a car with a thermal engine is about 60 and i wish we could reach that and ideally we should be able to get to 100 percent although we never will but when people speak to us um, that depends on context a lot but um, speaking from my own experience when I tell people, you know, I'm a linguist from a central national institution and I'm doing a PhD, but, you know, it's not just for myself, it's for science. Well, they entrust the data, not just to me personally, that I can be happy, but in the hope that, yeah, when they're gone, their kids can listen to it. Uh, and here there's a cultural element that in Buddhist areas where people believe in reincarnation, there's no taboo of speaking about dying and you know the next next generation coming up and people who know that their grandchildren that they reared themselves haven't imbibed the language somehow but they will be interested at some point some of them sure will be interested they want to listen to the language and if you can play to them pristine like on the day that it was spoken with translations into a language that they can understand which is going to be their mother tongue then that's something that I was told by you know my teacher of um, Yongling now said yeah so uh, it's cool because my grandchildren can um, listen to my voice when I'm dead so that was the thing putting the dots uh, on the map 
Okay, and uh, even for legacy materials, um, I would say especially for legacy materials, uh, the idea was to salvage what can be uh, rescued. So this is a photo of a young man who passed away last month, Michel Ferlus, and who uh, was um, a very interesting uh, thing. He, it would really be worth doing a long obituary and explanation on all the work that he did, uh, but I, I'll uh, be very brief. But basically, this is how he got in touch with uh, Laos, uh, got friends with people talking Kamu, Kamu, and learning the language and befriending the local people, and then becoming a linguist, really, in the field. And um, I got in touch with him in the late 1990s, and I said, you know, what about the data? And he said, well, why don't you go and collect your own data, which is a standard answer. And then in uh, 2012, when I went um, to Hanoi for some time to work, he said, oh, and by the way, it's, it'll do you some good to be in Hanoi again. And by the way, you can have my data. Um, because I'd been, you know, nagging him on and off saying, and by the way, are, are you sure that you're not going to return to Punoi, are you? Because he researched over 40 languages and dialects, which is a lot. And really following his researcher's intuition and not dwelling on the language beyond the time that he had fresh intuitions. Um, and that is an interesting uh, situation where I promised uh, a funder, um, Bibliothèque Scientifique Numérique, that um, we would digitize his data. And yes, honest to God, it would all be online because that was the funder's request at the time. They said, well, we can have some funding for digitization, but it's not just for, you know, putting it in a uh, safe, um, you know, um, um, putting it away in um, safe. It's for it to be public and open. So I promised, and I promised to Michel Ferlus that yes, 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 it's just for conservation, but nobody would ever listen to it. And then I had 18 months, which was the duration of the project, to um, try to convince him that uh, he could agree to that. So I'd made up my mind that in case he was adamant and said, no, don't open any of that, then I wouldn't you know, sign for things to be open because it was his data. And so we worked for 18 months in Hanau with a big team of, uh, you know, because with 46,000 euros, which is the only funded project I've got in my lifetime, but um, um, we could do a lot in, in Hanoi. Um, and luckily, towards the end, I asked language by language, saying this one is not going to be your next, next research interest, etc. But it's it's a diff difficult um, situation. I learned a lot in the process because I said, no, no, you can't put it out because you know you know what happened when I lent data of mine to somebody who said, oh, by the way, I'm interested in this language, that the data were never given back to him and they were used without citing him. So there's, those things happen um, and that's really bad. So I'm not casting the blame on people who are very protective about their own uh, data. We'll return to that as we go on. So all is well that ends well. It's the data's online um, in the best shape that we could. But that was the feeling at the time, you know, fighting against um, a lot of forces to try to avoid data being um, um, being lost. So at the time, um, what did I think about institutional review boards and research ethics review committees? Basically, I didn't have to think about it that much because they were not yet um, a requirement. So today, people doing a PhD would have to fill in a complete form and apply for authorization from um, an operational ethics review board in France. And we vaguely saw that coming uh, from afar and thought that, you know, does it really protect consultants and communities? Or does it protecting, is it more about protecting universities against liability that they can say, you know, none of our business, we're the platform, we're the host, and the fault lies with the researcher. So it's a bit anachronistic that I used recent, you know, uh, social media images um, 
without giving credit, but um, I think that one is pretty common. So, and anyway, um, that, yeah, the idea of ethics washing is very annoying for people who want to push real ethics and realize that you get people saying, oh, we're specialists in ethics and we can give you certification in ethics for not too much a price and no trouble at all to yourself, be assured. I think, no, that's going to go formal and that's basically the death of the process. And from the point of view of uh, our research in the field, there was a concern that formal ethics could only be out of touch with cultural diversity, because that's um, something we know about in our research institution, because we go to such different places, that if you go to Australia, if you go to North Africa, if you go to China, then the situations are going to be extremely different, including within China, if you want to work on this area or that one, the situations are going to be extremely different. And so the idea that we would know better what was a good way to do you know, non-extractivist practices or collaboration, and that people would sign that, yes, uh, they uh, had a common understanding with us and we could take this back home, black upon white, and show that you know, we were you know, following best practices. That didn't have a very convincing ring um, to colleagues at the lab. And basically I was saying the same thing as they were. So the, uh, an important question here is how far the national context is favorable to first language education. Um, so if there's a glass wall be between researchers and communities, because basically the less you mention dealing with um, languages that are not um, you know, the states wish as the national language, the better, then uh, you'll find that people will not be terribly interested or express very strong interest. And there can even be tensions between national recommendations and um, the needs of international collaborations. So this is a photo I took uh, in a um, on a, on a field trip um, going through a school. And it's again, the sort of a bit awkward practices that you're not supposed to be there taking photos, but you know, 2004, and it quite struck me that on the wall, there were those uh, red signs that uh, said, well, um, you know, uh, please speak the common language. And that's what we had in France very clearly which was um, applied uh, very savagely in the colonies, uh, that people were forbidden to use the uh, national language and in Bretagne as well. And that's not the very distant past. So I'm not laying the blame on anybody, just saying when you're doing field work in that kind of situation, then there's no, not a strong sense of self-determination on the part of um, the, the local people and the, um, legitimate re representative of women, for instance, or a certain minority or a certain religious group is going to be an organ of the party. And if there's just one party in the country, then that's uh, there's not a lot of uncertainty about that. And it could make a little trouble for me that I uh, played it badly, that I would just not go back. But it could make bigger trouble for the people who stay because that's... Um, then people would just come in for coffee and say, by the way, what were you doing with this nice young man? And if they don't have a good answer, that could um, create a lot of stress for them and potentially uh, trouble depending on changing circumstances. And so um, I was aware at the time that it would be the dumb thing to have a, a written or oral consent that the people did understand what it was about and would agree to that. Um, but the problem was if you want to have something written, um, the um, local templates I got had people's ID number, phone number, um, you know, and also served as a receipt of money given to them. So they gave, uh, it was complete copyright transfer. 
So exclusive copyright transfer. And so it sounded very ominous. And although mine was very different and had creative comments on it, it still looked the same for people who don't um, use writing. So um, I, at the time I didn't collect those because I felt it would be very awkward. There's, uh, the, the literature on that is uh, exists among linguists and is uh, very polarized between some people who say that there's, uh, you know, talk about the moral depravity of ethics protocols uh, and saying, let's just be far away from that. It's not my favorite paper because it's not um, written with enough detail and nuance, I think. Um, but um, in a sense, I still sided with that, saying we have to protect the people from an intrusion of uh, legal parlance and paperwork that could be uh, very worrying to them. And oral consent, I tried that, and it was more than usually awkward because, uh, you know, usually my teacher, she would address me and pretend that I understood everything, and we'd work through it again later. That was unusual, but workable. And then suddenly here I was asking her to uh, record something for somebody other than me that was going to be listened to by people who would sort of assess the lawfulness of what I was doing, but then she had to say it and she had to express herself in a language which only I could translate. So I would be the interpreter of that. And so the result was more than usually awkward that she said, you know, oh, and uh, okay, this guy came, he was presented to me by my son and, you know, whether he's clever or not, I leave for you to judge. But anyway, we've been working together and he writes things down and um, and he's nice. And that was, you know, it had attempts at humor in it, which were great, which are the real, you know, oral language. Um, but still, I felt I was you know, pushing my teacher in a corner that I shouldn't. So I didn't do that again later. Okay, and now comes the big change of prospect, um, opened by uh, colleagues. So here I would like to acknowledge Daniel Boursier, who was a keynote at the previous edition, um, who uh, changed my thinking single-handedly, basically, um, and who introduced Creative Commons licenses in France. So she knows what she would, she knew what she was talking about. And the law and ethics as allies in opening up research data, le droit et l'éthique comme alliés dans l'ouverture des données de la recherche en SHS, is the title of a workshop that was held a couple of years ago. And you look at that and you think, hmm, can it be that way? It would be cool, wouldn't it? And yes, that's how it can work out. So her point was that Creative Commons licenses are relevant in many countries. And uh, so if you want to be uh, very protective of your indigenous people and what do you think it could be called? I said, ah, you mean that's patronizing? And so, well, isn't it? And so it changed my thinking from thinking, you know, I'm the last ditch protecting these people against what? Against the country they're living in? Well, um, that's a strange way of thinking. And um, open Creative Commons licenses exist in Vietnam, Cambodia, in China, in the local law. And so if you explain to people that the paper you give to them means that they retain copyright over the, the materials and that they can listen to them, copy them, give them to other people for research, that is not exclusive copyright and copyright, I have to have it. Otherwise I can't copy the data from the recorder to the hard drive because I'm not allowed to handle data if I don't have a right to copy them. And that's not more than that. And then that, we're going to put, put it in an archive. And at the time, the archive was still accessible from Europe, which, uh, from China, sorry, which now it isn't. But so I think now it's uh, interesting that we can have an exchange as citizens of different countries, but thinking about, you know, those, those topics. Um, there's bad news coming later, but that was the happy, uh, another happy time. And so we had to go through, that was, you know, the mid uh, 2010s, uh, early 2020s, we did the GDPR declaration for the Pangloss collection. 
And that was a very interesting experience that um, we came out as having a legal basis for the work that students could then quote saying, you know, it's not just you have an empty paper saying, by the way, how sensitive are your data and how long do you intend to keep them and what's the legal basis for your processing data? But they would have a sort of, um, um, what's it called, boilerplate that they could start from uh, explaining, well, this is considered as not highly sensitive data and the basis is, you know, patrimony preservation, etc. And also the legal rules that the publisher is not the um, person, uh, the researcher, it's not the research unit, it's the employer. So for people working for CNRS, that's the data publisher. And that cleared up a lot of, um, um, a lot of questions. I think I'll rush to the end and then have a, a good long discussion with you rather than open questions, but I feel we should talk about those. Um, and now in comes NLP, and I've used up most of my time, but still there's a bit of time. Um, okay, first NLP came as carrying considerable potential for language documentation and research. And so you know about those. Um, and applicative prospects include speech recognition. So we did a bit of that text-to-speech alignment so that people can, sorry, people can, um, uh, you know, navigate data at the sentence level instead of just having a PDF and a long recording and data mining uh, on which, you know, Stephen is in a, an expert. So he has lots of um, excellent proposals on this. Uh, Nisan recently is taking up the ball and a uh, very vibrant team meeting at the Compute EL workshop with commitment to delivery, not over-promising is one thing, and then delivering on those promises that have been made. And there's also important prospects for fundamental research in computer science, which is cool news for the linguists because that means there's additional motivation for the NLP people to be part of that. Uh, that uh, Oliver Adams, who was a, a student of Stephen reported that he had done an experiment pretending that he uh, was transferring from a minority, from a national language to a minority language. And the well-documented language was German and the un fully undocumented language was Dutch. So he just pretended we knew nothing about Dutch. So he ran the experiments. And later he did experiments on real uh, fieldwork data. And he said, ah, suddenly it felt so much healthier to be, you know, uh, get your teeth into a real life problem and data that basically you're breaking new grounds and there's a real issue and it's not a mock scenario. That felt so much better. So that was his um, testimony and it sounds very cool. And over and above differences in methods, um, you know, that linguists have been doing the same stuff for at least 150 years happily and don't want to change the method, just apply it consistently and keep going. Whereas NLP people can't just say, well, I prefer to use, you know, rule-based synthesis for uh, French prosody because nobody would buy that currently. Still, there can be convergence on shared values and that's ethos and that's ethics. So we can have the same ethics of mutual respect, recognition of complementarity, shared commitment to language work. So I won't elaborate on that, but there's been some very uh, exciting um, activity in this field, bringing a lot of enthusiasm to language workers who, uh, you know, um, sometimes can feel very lonely um, in the field against lots and lots and lots of difficulties, questionings, you know, uh, which all of which are real and legitimate and that's life, but which are really tough to carry on one's shoulders. So there was a sense of alliance that was really precious. So we not only made all the data open access since the uh, you know late 1990s, that you can go and take a look at it on, online, pangloss.cnrs.fr, but we also realized that it may not be enough for the materials to be open access under Creative Commons license, that some people in NLP didn't know Creative Commons, so they would send emails saying, can I have the corpus? And when we said, well, can't you read? It's it's open. I said, well, we, we meant 
could you give us easy access that we don't need to scrape the website and you know click for each resource and so we we did uh, several things to facilitate NLP specialists access to language archive materials as part of the uh, lift uh, linguistic informatique formel et de terrain uh, network and uh, we did a dump on Zenodo uh, things like that and now coming to the worries so that's um, interesting discussions we had inside the the lab that if there's shoplifting going to hope to, to happen in open archives that people would um, either you know grab data use them for model training even though the license doesn't allow it maybe because it wasn't really uh, pre-planned in the uh, creative commons terms of the licenses you know that um, those are new usages in a way um, and the law is kind of trying to catch up but that's not easy and it's only it's also a possibility that people knew about the licenses but say you know uh, for the sake as Tim Nitz, uh and Alex put it yesterday at the mystery AI theater you know if you're going to deprive my machine of data then you're a murderer because you're going to kill the billions of humans who are going to live on Mars later, thanks to you know my technology saving the world. So anything standing in the way of the manifest destiny of big data to swallow it all is murder. Which sounds very excessive, but the, the documents they brought up were very excessive. So there's an um, element of that. So I'm not completely confident about the regard that people who have a data set of endangered languages, which they know to be under some kind of license that they don't care to read, would this would re refrain from using it for training. You know better. Okay, this is a quote from Emily, but um, now I think we understand, and if we haven't, then it's a good time to have a good read at it, that we have a tendency to attribute meaning to text. So if we let this kind of tool be deployed, then there's going to be a uh, real world harm. Right, and now, yes. So specifically, uh, a colleague at the lab said that speakers in um, Indonesia asked her, they said, you know, because she can speak their language totally. And they said, can uh, the government understand what we're saying over the phone in totally? And she said, currently, no. Uh, but that's the question that really mattered to them. If she put on her uh, award-winning corpus, uh, which won the um, uh, prize, they used to call it the Delaman, it, Franz Boas Prize, now it's called Delaman Prize, so it's a super corpus, and, you know, we'd like to do things with it, like, you know, produce a grammar from the glosses, and there's lots of potential, but she said, I would prefer not to, you know, as Bartleby, you know, um, the American novel, that person who has been cautious and when people said, you know, could you please, I would, I, I would prefer not to, should prefer not to open the corpus. And even two years ago, I would say, come on, you're not going to stop anything bad happening because if people want to um, deploy surveillance for totally, they'll, um, they'll do it. And, you know, all they need is a maybe five to 10 hours that they can rustle up a couple of speakers. So, but you're depriving colleagues of beautiful data. And so go ahead and share it. But now I think it's all going so fast that maybe I understand that colleagues don't want to be part of deployment of surveillance tools or the like. And so take home messages, a big pile of them. I, I'm not a good, person to tell you the take home messages. This, basically, that's the my um, own conclusion. Looking back on the these topics is that the ethical and sociopolitical issues raised by, raised by the creation, electronic publication, and exploitation of fieldwork data must, give in, must be given a central place rather than hoping for ready-made solutions to deflect concerns and fend off trouble. So in a sense, it goes without saying, but um, in another, it's if that's something we can agree on, it's uh, a good thing to uh, clarify. 
and maybe a good basis for um, collaborations. Um, and also the need for constant collective reflection involving specialists in natural language processing, because in order to understand the implications today, or we can read the press, try to figure out what it means. And in order to understand possible implications for the future, then we need to talk to you because you can have a sense of where things are going. So nobody knows about the future, but this is certainly uh, an important conversation to have. Um, and I feel I haven't said even 100% of things that could be said, but it's a short sign I should stop here and leave it to questions. <laughs>